Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Q4 FY23 earnings conference call of Apar Industries Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Ambesh Tiwari from Essential Technologies. Thank you and over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ambesh Tiwari from Essential Technologies. I welcome you all to the fourth quarter FY23 earnings call for Apar Industries. To discuss the business performance and outlook, we have from the management side, Mr. Kushal Desai, Chairman and Managing Director, Mr. Chaitanya Desai, Managing Director, and the CFO, Mr. Ramesh Ayer. I would now pass on the mic to Mr. Kushal Desai for the opening remarks. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Ambesh. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I will uh, start off by giving a quick overview of our performance and follow that up with a short industry update. We can then get into more details on the segmental performance of our three major businesses. And post that, uh, we will open up the floor uh, to questions. So during the fourth quarter of FI23, the consolidated revenue for Apar came in at 4,089 crores, which is 36% uh, higher than the previous year. We witnessed volume growth across all the three divisions, and in particular, export of conductors and cables, which were the major contributors to this overall growth. Exports grew by 80% year on year, contributing to 53% of the company's revenues for the quarter, compared to 39% a year ago. The EBITDA uh, for the quarter is up 146% to 445 crores, at a margin of 10.9%. PAT came in at rupees 243 crores which is 194% higher than in the previous year. Uh, the fat percentage is 5.9% versus 2.7% a year ago. On a, if you look at a full year consolidated basis, the revenue came in at 14,352 crores, um, carrying a growth of 54% year on year. Fat uh, at 638 crores is 148% higher than uh, the previous year. Export for the full year uh, contributed towards 49% of the total revenues, which is 97% higher than in the previous period. This has been an all-time high uh, top line and bottom line for the company as well as for export revenues. Coming to the power sector, I would like to just update a few, uh, a couple of major areas. The power generation in India grew at the fastest pace that it has in the last three decades with a jump of about 11.5%. This was led by actually the intense summer heat wave from the last summer and colder than usual winter in northern India. There was also an economic recovery that led to a jump in electricity demand. This forced the cranking up of output from coal plants as well as solar uh, farms um, as there was this, scrum, this scramble to actually avoid uh, power cuts. So the output from plants running on fossil fuels grew by 11.2%, which is actually the quickest growth that has happened in the last three decades. There was a 12.4% surge in electricity production from coal and that offset a decline that had happened uh, from gas-fired plants, basically due to the spike in LNG prices. So if you look at the total power supply during the last fiscal, it is at 1.5 trillion kilowatt hours, which is 8.4% higher than in the previous year. India still faced a power deficit of 6.69 billion units. And this is the widest deficit that it has had in the last six years. So even though power production was 8.4% higher, the deficit was still uh, the widest in the last six years. In the new fiscal that began uh, last month, Indian power plants are expected to increase 
coal uh, generation uh, power generation from coal by about 8 percent the acceleration of coal fired output to address the spike in power demand highlights the challenges which are being faced by india as we try to wean off uh, the usage of carbon and ensure energy security for uh, our population on the renewable side india's solar capacity additions have grown by about 20 percent during the just ended fiscal year of uh, fy23 boosting the renewable energy output to 33 billion units or approximately 22 percent of the total uh, power being uh, generated um, the green energy output helped prevent 32.5 million tons of co2 emission um, that would otherwise have been produced from coal <coughs> The share of renewables in power generation, excluding big hydro and nuclear power, so essentially this is uh, small hydro, uh, solar and wind, has increased to 11.8% compared to 10.8% in the previous year. And the main increase has come from solar, which is 35% higher than in the previous year. I would now like to spend a few minutes to cover the business highlights. Our conductor uh, business has revenues in Q4 uh, FI23 growing by 41% year on year to reach 2,121 crores with a volume growth of 46% in the quarter. The export revenue grew by 81% year on year contributing towards 58% of the division's overall revenues. The premium products contributed to 45% of the revenue mix. EBITDA per metric ton post forex adjustment came in at 58,000 rupees a ton, which is a historic high. And we have been mentioning earlier, the conductor division has seen uh, a major transformation in its journey over the past decade. And the various investments which we have made in R&D have helped us to tap opportunities both in the domestic as well as the overseas markets. Looking at a 12 month picture, the conductor division revenues came in at 7,013 crores, which is up 67% year on year. The uh, physical volumes of conductors manufactured is up 49%. The EBITDA per metric ton for the full year period came in at 44,114 rupees per metric ton, which is 158% higher than in the previous year. The total order book that we have uh, as of 31st March stands at 5,124 crores for the conductor division. So overall, the division has had an excellent quarter as well as the best 12 months in its history. The division's higher profitability can be attributed to a, uh, to a much higher share of premium products as well as uh, a high share, a historic high for uh, exports in the non-premium products. Also, the market conditions uh, in FY23 were the most favorable that we've seen uh, during the post-COVID period, where customers paid a premium for uh, reliability and quality, and also there was substantial freight gain as the container freight rationalized over the year. The losses from uh, FY21 and 22 due to freight uh, were to a very large extent actually uh, compensated in FY23. Having said that, the competitive dynamics in this division have intensified, um, including from uh, Chinese suppliers who have started pricing uh, sharper and also are trying to find ways around the higher uh, tax regimes that have been applied on them from the United States. We also are seeing an inventory adjustment taking place as customers reduce the higher level of inventories that they had built up to insulate against supply chain bottlenecks. Um, so this has resulted in a, a, a lower level of, uh, of orders which have been coming in in the short term. 
Coming to the oil division, Q4 FI23 revenues came in at 1,179 crores, which is up 28% year on year. The volumes grew by 12% in the quarter, driven uh, by a higher uh, base oil price. Export contributed towards 45% by revenues and 47% by volume. EBITDA post forex adjustment came in at 3,697 rupees per KL, which is in line with the guidance which we had given earlier. The lubricant revenue for the quarter was 231 crores, with a total volume of 18,370 KL. So during the 12 month period, Oil revenues are up 31% to 4,656 crores. The volume grew 5% in the period. EBITDA post uh, Forex came in at 4,781 rupees per KL. And this was largely due to a much higher margin in the first quarter. And then a revival uh, of bringing margins back closer to normalcy in the February, March months. Transformer oil, which accounts for about a third of the oil division, grew at a faster pace than the other categories. And with the developments that are happening in the infrastructure space, we expect a steady demand to continue for transformer oil, both domestically as well as overseas. Towards the end of the year, the margin pressures which were there from the mismatch in cost versus selling prices have also eased. Um, and we should see better profitability and consistency in performance even on the lubricant side, which includes the industrial and automotive lubricants. Now coming to our cable business, our cable business revenues grew 38% in the fourth quarter to reach 943 crores with a significant increase coming from our elastomeric cables as well as exports. Exports contributed towards 54% of sales in Q4 versus just 27% a year ago. The elastomeric cable revenue grew by 20%. We see robust business continuing to come in the renewables energy space, especially from uh, solar installation. The EBITDA post forex came in at 117 crores, which is 12.4% of revenues. So this is a good 7% higher than what it was in the same period previous year. Looking at the 12 month picture, FY23 uh, had cable revenues increased by 64% year on year uh, at 3,263 crores. The elastomeric and export business were the two main drivers with export contributing towards 52% of the annual revenues of the division. The EBITDA for the year came in at 10.3% versus 5.3% for the previous 12 months. So overall, we had a, a, a very strong FI23 and this has of course been the all-time high performance uh, across all the three major divisions combined. Um, robust growth not only in the top line but also on the bottom line. Um, we are quite optimistic about growth prospects of the company as the domestic and global macro environment uh, continues to remain favorable with the thrust on uh, infrastructure and renewables which we expect will continue for the next few years. We also recognize that in FY24, the post-COVID demand and premium on quick and reliable delivery um, as well as some of the strong tailwinds may taper to some extent, but we are overall quite positive about uh, the prospects of business over the next uh, three to five years. I would also like to point out that we have updated our corporate presentation uh, to make it current. It's already up on the website and it carries a, a lot of detailed information uh, much beyond what I was able to uh, summarize earlier in the call. I would also request uh, uh, you all to go through the, uh, the latest APAR ESG report, which was put up a couple of months ago in the sustainability section of our website. And that updates all the company-wide initiatives in this most important area. 
So with this, I'd like to come to the end of my comments. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you for joining this call. And uh, uh, we can open up the floor to questions, please. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one at this time. The first question is from the line of Garrett Cohen from Invest Research. Please go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, good evening, sir. And congratulations for a good service. Uh, my question is uh, particularly on the conductor segment side. Uh, like you mentioned in quarter one, FI 23 console, uh, you guided for a beta pattern uh, somewhere around 17,000 to 18,000. So my question is, uh, what exactly the driving the change in EBITDA uh, person? Like, uh, I think three quarters before you mentioned 17,000 to 18,000 in this particular quarter, this figure is around 65,000 person. This is a significant change. So uh, if this is a permanent change, like because of the sexual changes you are uh, mentioning, product mix and geographical mix, so then I think investor community should assume these kind of realizations going ahead, right? Uh, I'm asking this because uh, from here, if realizations come down, then we will not be able to grow our EBITDA in particular segment, even if the volume grows. There are multiple reasons uh, for uh, this uh, increase in EBITDA. One of the key reasons, is, and we have elaborated in our investor corporate presentation also, is the transformation shift that has happened in the conductor division over the last two, three years. Earlier, it was largely the conventional conductors catering to the domestic market where the margin used to be less because of competition intensity. But over the last two, three years, we have been uh, executing more of premium conductors uh, due to which uh, our margin profile has changed considerably as compared to the earlier period. What has also happened in FI23 is that not only we have been servicing the domestic market, but uh, also opportunities uh, are coming in the export market. So what we see in FI23 is that not only our conventional uh, conductors that cater to the export market have increased in margins, but and also the premium conductors have also been having a high margin. So overall put together, uh, we have seen a high uh, margin in FI23. And also some of the macroeconomic and geopolitical environment has favored us. That has also helped us to increase the margin in this year. So my question is still not answered. Right, uh, going ahead, uh, whether these kind of uh, margins or uh, realizations are sustainable or not uh, for this particular segment. So we have been increasing our guidance uh, continuously over the last one year, and uh, we continue to uh, to keep a guidance of about 25,000 per metric ton EBITDA at this stage also. Plus some of the tailwinds that may come in, in the future, which as of now it's difficult to predict because it depends on various uh, macroeconomic and geopolitical situations. Uh, even uh, last quarter, we have been riding about 25,000 per metric. And so at this stage, we feel that uh, on a long-term basis, we expect the EBITDA to continue at about 25,000 per metric. Ton. Any uh, tailwinds that arise in future uh, would be added uh, on top of this margin. You are saying this macroeconomic environment, and part of the reason you mentioned is rate. So, rate rates are coming down. So, that will be reflected in your uh, EBITDA realization, right, in the coming quarters. Yeah, freight rates uh, have been coming down, and accordingly, we pass on the freight benefits also to the customers, uh, unless there are some uh, prices which are already locked in the pending orders. But largely, we pass on the cost uh, to our customers. Okay, and what about the volume growth in FI24 on the conductor and uh, this particular oil segment price? Uh, can, you, can you repeat the question because the voice was a little muffled? Uh, yeah, I was asking for the volume growth guidance. Uh, for, uh, so the volume growth, we expect uh, approximately a 10% uh, growth uh, in volumes to 175 to 180,000 metric tons. Also, further to what Ramesh uh, mentioned, 
that uh, in FY23, there were a, a couple of uh, uh, very helpful tailwinds where, you know, we had taken freight hits in FY21 and 22, which uh, uh, turned positive in FY23 wherever the freight rates had been uh, fixed. Now, going forward, as you get into FY24, the rates obviously are more current and we don't expect any, uh, any gain coming from there. The second thing is that as, um, uh, you know, supply chains were quite broken uh, leading up to FI23, uh, customers in the United States and many of the export markets who actually bore the brunt of this were uh, prepared to uh, pay a premium to suppliers who had high quality and high reliability because their projects were already delayed. And uh, as a consequence, uh, you know, the negotiations really or the premium that you got on the price uh, was relatively easy to pull during FY23. Now, having supply chains, having got normalized, uh, obviously uh, there is uh, more discussion, negotiation and uh, pressure on prices and margins, which is more in line with the normal scenario. And what Ramesh also mentioned in here is that because of the premiumization of products, you will see a long-term change in the EBITDA from 10, 11,000 rupees a ton, which is what we had for several years, increasing to the 25,000 uh, plus, of course, if there are any uh, tailwinds which come in, but a steady state of 25,000 uh, per metric ton. And sir, you mentioned the supply chains getting normalized. So whether they have been normalized or they are going to be normalized in coming quarters? So the supply chains have all got normalized now. So today getting containers is not a problem, uh, not only in India but anywhere in the world. Uh, there's enough capacity of liners. There is no congestion uh, at ports, you know, which is landing up with hundreds of vessels, you know, wanting to burn. So that whole thing has got cleaned up in the United States and in most ports around the world. So, uh, so supply chains are now pretty much, uh, pretty much normal. Okay, and over the uh, oil segment side, right, so what will be the volume growth side and the EBITDA realization? So, on the in the oil vertical, we are looking at about a five percent volume growth, and uh, our guidance on EBITDA, you know, will continues in the five to six thousand rupees uh, per KL. Last year we came in at uh, a little over forty seven hundred, but uh, with the situation having pretty much normalized in terms of unit margins, especially for the lubricant side of the business. Um, our guidance is around 5,000 to 6,000 rupees per KL with a 5% increase in uh, production. And now if you ask for the third division, which is the cable division, um, there we are expecting about 25 to 30 growth and an EBITDA between 10 and 12%. Okay, thank you. And one last question is, uh, you mentioned in your uh, remarks regarding uh, FY24 taking a kind of muted one. So, is it likely to be a muted one uh, going forward? On... Again, I couldn't hear your question. Uh, could you repeat that, please? Sorry, oh, Dr. Uh, Will, uh, there is any disturbance coming from your line, sir. Request you to use the handset mode, please. Yes. Hello? Uh, I'm audible, sir. Uh, yeah, this is a little uh, better, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, sir, in your opening remarks, you mentioned uh, like FY24 to paper off or kind of. So, uh, can we take uh, if this is going to be a muted one? So, muted in the sense that uh, both we expect both the uh, oil division and the cable division to have uh, a higher revenue and profitability, uh, profit number. In the case of conductors, uh, you will see a higher growth, but the uh, profitability, you know, which is which average 44,000 for the year, is uh, something that's uh, not easy to repeat. So, uh, because there were a number of favorable uh, favorable wins, so our guidance for that is 25,000 plus. You know, there could be some tailwinds that actually come in, uh, but that would be clear only once you start closing orders. You know, we're right at the beginning of the year. And there's still a lot of uncertainty that's, uh, you know, that's running. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir, and all the rest for the news. Okay, right. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
The next question is from the line of Pratiksha Daftari from Equitas Investments. Please go ahead. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. So, uh, right, you mentioned that, you know, please coming down and contact. Pratiksha, uh, uh, your, your voice is quite feeble. Hello. Can, you, can yes. I audible? Yes, 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 yes. So, okay, I was saying that with, uh, you know, you mentioned that competition is intensified and freight benefit would also probably not, uh, par you know, carry, be sustainable in next year. What about, uh, you know, our raw material prices, uh, with metal prices being, you know, in a range-bound fashion, would that also impact our profitability going ahead? So, uh, you know, as we've always mentioned in the past, we don't really take a call on uh, raw material prices. We just uh, we just hedge. Um, premium have gone up slightly. Uh, the NJP, uh, which is one of the key benchmarks in terms of measuring premium, they were steady at around uh, 80 to 90 dollars a ton, which have now increased to about 120 dollars a ton. But that is being factored into the pricing of our um, of our product. So we don't really see any major uh, impact from the metal side because it's all back to back hedge. Okay, got it. And uh, in terms of the order book that we mentioned about, I think 5,200 odd crores, how much would be premium products and how much would be exports? This about uh, so 5,000 crore, about 40% would be premium products. Okay. And uh, exports? Uh, exports out of 5,000 could be about uh, 60%. Okay. And what I understand is that we had some share of railway orders and conductors. Do we see that, uh, you know, plateauing considering that the railway electrification uh, target is nearly achieved or at least a good amount of work is done? So, uh, there are, there are the, the following, you know, sort of phenomena that's happening that there was uh, program one was uh, converting diesel to uh, electricity in terms of running the locomotives. So that program is at a very advanced stage. You'll only see about another year or so uh, in which uh, that target will be met. However, what's happened is that uh, the, uh, the uh, lines which have been set up, both contact and catenary lines, mm -hmm. are uh, not high capacity or high amplicity lines. As in, there's limitations in terms of the amount of current that it can carry to run one day Bharat train and high speed trains at its full capacity. Okay. So therefore there will be uh, a certain level of reconducting that will come up if these trains are supposed to reach their full potential. So I guess the program will get over and then there could be uh, could be a gap and then these reconductings will have to be done otherwise you've got trains that can run at you know 160, 180 kilometers and are running at only about 100 kilometers an hour. Okay, understood. And in terms of, I know that you guided for it. By the way, Apar has been ready with this from day one. We've been, we have the alloys, uh, you know, uh, the R&D was done several years ago and products were already ready and commercialized. But at that point in time, Indian Railways didn't want to use the high amplicity uh, product. So as these uh, tenders come up, we are already ready with the products. Wonderful. That's, that's really nice to hear. Okay, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, order pipeline, if you could get, uh, share some color on that. Hello? This, uh, sorry, what was your question on? Pipeline of order. Pipeline, pipeline. Order pipeline for uh, both cables and conductors. Oh, conductors, uh, we still in about 5,000 crores, the pending order book. Okay. No, I was just mentioning the tenders that are open because we are seeing a lot of TND orders that are getting announced uh, for the EPC company. So just wanted to understand what are the what, how does the orders that are in process look like? Yeah, those are going on in a full fledged way right now. They are in the process of uh, placing orders on domestic uh, parties such as ourselves. And those will be executed in this financial year. And then next round of TPCB tenders are expected, which will help us to, you know, feed the, the supplies in the next financial year. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, one question on cables. Uh, uh, just update on the CAPEX plan. And also, what is the execution period of the order book? 
So, um, the order book which uh, has been spoken about is the uh, order book for conductors. This one key. And, uh, huh. yeah. People, we have given an order book of about uh, 1200 crores. Should be just over a quarter's uh, order book. Okay. All right. And uh, the capex for cables? So, is a total uh, capex that we are, you know, uh, planning to invest is about 400 to 450 crores over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, because some of these are now longer lead items, you know, for increasing capacity. Um, so, uh, of that, the cable portion is uh, approximately 260 to 270 crores. Okay. And that includes actually uh, us acquiring a new greenfield site, right. which is closer, close to where the current plants are located. So our plan on the cable side is to do this capex uh, and invest a little bit ahead of the curve. Because, you know, uh, for example, um, while talking to all the major customers that we have in the United States, uh, their projection is that their execution of solar installations today is running at about 15 gigawatts per annum. And in two years time, they expect it to run at 30 gigawatts per annum. So, uh, also if you see in India, every year the implementation of renewable energy has been growing. So, that's the reason why our plan is to invest in total capex of the company about 400 odd crores. Um, Conductor division will be about 100 crores, cable will be about uh, 260 to 275 crores, and the oil division is uh, much smaller at about 20 to 25 crores. Okay, but we had some capacity that was um, uh, expected to be commissioned sometime around this quarter or next, right? So we have one phase of this which is getting commissioned uh, in uh, end of June, beginning of July. So that capacity will be available from the third quarter. But uh, there's a whole lot of new equipment uh, that's been ordered and continuously through the year you will see it coming in and uh, getting installed. There is a, uh, the Greenfield side of course has some amount of upfront investments in the acquisition of the land and getting the Greenfield side ready. But then uh, once the initial uh, site is ready, then it allows us to again modularly keep on expanding uh, capacity on that site. Okay, understood. And in terms of our uh, interest cost, how do we look at that? Uh, look at that going ahead. Would that be in, uh, you know increasing in tandem with the volume growth? So interest cost have almost peaked now in uh, quarter four, quarter three, okay. quarter four. So okay. and, uh, Depending on further increase in interest rate, it could further go up. But we feel that about quarter four numbers uh, uh, could be what we expect for the rest of the year, unless there are further increases. Of course, it will go up in line with the volume increases, but in terms of the rate, quarter four captures uh, uh, most of it. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, congratulations for good set of numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Charanjit Singh from DSP Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and congratulations on a good set of numbers. So, so especially I want to touch on the export side uh, in terms of you know overall contribution. We have seen rising to almost on 49% exports. And if you can just you know give us more color in terms of the different geographies, like you touched about you know US, especially. Uh, and uh, I think you were also working on the other geographies, maybe like Australia and all. How we can see this exports? Can we see it going further up? Uh, what's the kind of you know uh, growth on this high base? We can see in the exports uh, overall opportunity. That's my first question. Okay. So on the export front, the growth is really uh, being led basically by the addition of renewable energy. And um, the largest market that we have currently is North America, is the United States. Um, but uh, uh, cable uh, sales into Europe has also started increasing, mostly going into, again, solar uh, installations. We've seen a steady uh, growth in or I mean, a, a steady set of orders coming in from Australia, where we are seeing basically two areas. We're seeing uh, solar and wind installations, again, that's the renewable energy generation, plus 
the uh, metros that are being built in all the major australian cities so because we uh, supplied to we were one of two major suppliers into the sydney metro we are getting an opportunity to also bid on metros that are being developed in all the other major australian cities um besides this there are opportunities that are coming up even in latin america countries like colombia chile uh, etc um and uh, uh, in africa we've been uh, supplying product largely to ethiopia which has been uh, you know either asian uh, sorry african development bank funded or other multilateral agencies funding uh, uh, you know electrical infrastructure there so these are the principal geographies where you know we are seeing the growth and we expect that for the next 3 4 years the growth will continue from these from these geographies there are on and off demand from many others but these are the five six major markets from where we see the business coming for both our uh, conductors as well as cables in terms of the oil side of the business the, the supply overseas is quite steady again any electrical installation needs a transformer and these transformers are all oil filled so um, you know there's steady growth taking place um even on the transformer oil side and uh, sir you talked about you know this chinese you know uh, now manufacturers also at you know looking at these markets so how do you see china opening up you know impacting and their supplies you now getting back into the you know market uh, and you also highlighted that they are trying to you know overcome some of the you know duties and all so can that impact these export numbers to any extent so i don't think uh, it will uh, it will affect necessarily the volume of export that we have because the market itself is expanding but it uh, there could be an influence on the unit pricing um and uh, there are two things the chinese companies are generally doing one is that they have been involved in uh, mma activity buying out uh, players in located in favorable geographies and uh, not changing the name of the company or anything and uh, continuing to supply um, you know in those companies names they have also set up manufacturing or are looking at setting up manufacturing in in other geographies uh, which are green field um, and finally they some of the companies are setting up finishing facility so the conductor and various other parts of the cable will be coming in from china and just the final step is done in a uh, country like vietnam or korea or one of these which uh, don't have any uh, or do carry some favorable uh, duty structures with respect to the united states etc so however when you do all of this there is a cost increase that takes place you're not just as competitive as manufacturing in china and exporting but it's uh, it it saves them money relative to paying the higher us duties for example so we see that the pricing may come under some amount of uh, margins may come on, come under some amount of pressure but the volume itself is growing i hope that answers your question yes sir that's very helpful sir if you can just also give the numbers for acceptances how acceptances uh, have moved yes so our interest bearing uh, acceptance is about uh, 3600 crores you are about letter of credit yes now is that the number you wanted yes sir. and uh, how, how do you see now acceptance is going forward any thoughts on uh... you know this is usual uh, critical for us for acceptance you now we we take the credit period uh, for the maximum period and you know it will go up in line with the volume of the business and the uh, rates of uh, the key raw material okay sir so just lastly from my side if i can squeeze in another question uh, you have also talked about industries and corporate as one of the segment which is almost around 17% of our you know revenue and this is you know having a, a very significant you know industries like railways defense shipping and uh, so you know if you can touch upon how these industry segments are operating and do we see a significant uptick uh, coming in these segments 
so uh, for the, from the cable perspective the railways will be a major segment going forward because as you can see there is a very large amount of locomotives uh, that are being ordered in fact siemens uh, has received an order for 1200 locomotives to be delivered over 10 years uh, similarly there all these vande bharat trains are going in which consists of the locomotive and the bogies it's a full integrated train so as a consequence cables and the railways are definitely increasing there's also capex that's happening in the industrial uh, segment so you know uh, manufacturing plants coming up etc so the good thing is that no matter what plant you are agnostic to manufacturing plant you need cables to be able to deliver power to run you know the equipment etc so that's where we are seeing this uh, you know the industrial side picking up the railways as far as defense is concerned there is a steady increase taking place it's nothing dramatic but you will see a step up on the railway side because of the uh, large locomotive and uh, vande bharat expansions that are happening got it sir so just one thing on anushakti wire you know because uh, wires is another segment where we had uh, hello yes yeah just just last question from my side sir uh, this difference hello yeah continue yeah so just on anushakti wires sir because we had started you know doing significant uh, branding exercise channel expansion and a lot of team building on that side as we can see so if you can just touch upon that initiative this is the last question yeah yeah so that uh, is going a uh, very uh, very fine for us uh, you know if you see we have a slide on that that shows you how much progress we have done over the last one year in terms of increasing our uh, channel expansion distributor presence active state presence uh, as well as various uh, demos and uh, refreshing me so it is progressing as per our uh, internal estimates uh, on on the on the overall sales So essentially we had i mean if you look at the channel almost a, a 70% growth uh, from last year to this year and then we will see on an equal growth uh, from this year to the next year so we are adding almost uh, a little over 100 crores a year you know from fy23 to fy24 as far as that channel is concerned so it's basically the the uh, the anchor products there are these are anushakti wires um which are the best in class and then along with that you know there are other uh, lt cables and uh, um three core flat and a whole bunch of other products that go uh, along with that through that uh, distribution channel so that part of the business is is growing um if you go to the corporate presentation that has been put up on the website there is a slide that actually details um, you know dealer edition retailer edition etc etc great sir so thanks for taking my questions uh, that's all from my side yeah thank you thank you the next question is from the line of kaushik mohan from ashika stock broking please go hi sir uh, thanks for the opportunity and congratulations for the great set of numbers uh i just wanted to understand uh, your order book and what is the total size of the order book currently and for how many years is that order book is there for so conductor's order book is about 5000 crores and typically fixed period about you know 6 to 7 months 7 to 8 months of uh, uh, execution because of cable our order book uh, is 1200 crores it will be just over a quarter okay uh so and i got i also wanted to understand another thing what is your revenue guidance for the coming next three years so we have given a uh, guidance on uh, the case of conductors the uh, volume would be uh, about 10 to 15 percentage in the case of oil it would be 5 percentage on volume and cable uh, value would be about 25 to 30 percentage yeah, okay uh and sir is this the net profit currently which is around 4% 4.5% is this a sustainable margin going forward so we don't uh, uh we guidance on the profit percentage because uh, the the values and the percentage will depend on the raw materials and the price movements therefore we give an ebitda guidance which is already been shared sure I, i can see that in the presentation and the presentation is really fantastic sir and the last and final question what is your conversions of cash flow from operations to ebitdas or ebitdas to cash flow from operations 
uh, it's actually there in the cash flow statement, so you can see that. Publish the cash flow statement where you'll be able to see the future year because normally it is standing at a 50 percentage on average. I just wanted to understand in the coming years also, will it be the same? Uh, well, it should be in line with uh, the sales growth that should happen unless if there are any abnormal changes in working capital, which we don't expect at the moment. Okay. Uh, sir, another capex of 450 crores is your, what you are speaking about. Uh, yeah, in 450. Next, uh, 400, uh, 450 crores. So uh, it, it is going to be in the duration of next uh, one year to 18 months. Uh, sir, uh, this major capex of this one will be in the cable segment. Am I, is my understanding right? Yeah, about 200 and, uh, 260 to 275 crores will be in the cable segment, about 100 crores in conductors and around uh, 20 to 25 crores in the oil business. Okay. Uh, so, sir, uh, what can be the incremental asset terms on this uh, cable side, only on the cable segment? Uh, between 8 eight to 10 times. 8 to 10 times. Thanks, sir. Thanks for this. And congratulations for the fantastic numbers. And I expect same kind of presentations in the future. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Mihir from Carnelian Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for giving the opportunity and uh, congratulations on a good set of numbers. Uh, sir, largely wanted to understand, I mean, uh, when we see the share of premium products, so that's like was 49% last time and has gone uh, to 44% this time. So it is the exports plus the freight benefit, uh, which is driving the overall profitability on the conductor side of the business. Uh, so I mean, just wanted to understand, uh, you know, I mean, uh, given with now Chinese players coming into picture, uh, uh, how are you seeing the implemental orders getting priced in? Uh, so the 5,000 crore order book that we are having, uh, what is what could be the pricing of uh, those, those that order book? And uh, when will when one should expect the normalization of margins to happen? Uh, do you expect that to immediately happen in first quarter, second quarter, or do you expect that to be more back ended or uh, in second half of the year? And also wanted to understand the freight cost. And you know, uh, currently we have posted 58,000 uh, kind of a profitability. Uh, so what could be the element of freight cost benefit uh, that one should consider in this number, uh, which will not be there in the normalized number? Yeah, so just wanted to understand that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, freight cost uh, for us uh, actually will depend on the execution of orders because we, the order book, you may have a long pending order and uh, the execution of that may take, uh, some of the execution may take more than three months, six months, or so there could be some order uh, orders in the pending order book that may get executed in FY24. Uh, it, it's very difficult to give an exact number of how much could be the freight because there are various factors. There could be freight saving, there could be steel cost saving, etc., uh, which could be included there. And there could be some carry forward uh, from the pre-COVID uh, COVID times order that is coming into into this execution. So it's very difficult to give uh, a number that we can uh, say that X amount of uh, savings per metric ton is included in 58,000 which may or may not recur in future. And that's, that's why we are actually giving a guidance uh, for the future profitability, which is you know, 25,000 per metric ton plus the tailwinds that can come uh, in, in various forms, which includes trade, which includes macro environment and uh, Chinese competition intensity, et cetera. Sure, sure, sir. And just on the uh, order booking that we are having, 5,000 crores of or the book. I mean, just uh, to understand it qualitatively, uh, let's say while building new orders over the last uh, three, four months, uh, given the fact that Chinese competition is coming back, uh, are we building, uh, I mean, projects at comparatively lower margins than what we were building, uh, let's like, say, uh, six months back? So, you know, let me just comment uh, on that. So, the as far as the domestic market is concerned, of course, the Chinese uh, don't have a role to play. Um, there, um, as the TBCB contracts uh, or, or other tenders keep growing, there's been one major change in that. So uh, from FY25 onwards, we will see benefits that uh, uh, a higher grade conductor is being used, which is an HTLS conductor, which is called AL90, uh, AL59. Um, so there is one change that's happening uh, in that, it's it's like an in-between conductor. It's not HTLS, but it's an upgrade on uh, on just a uh, normal conventional conductor. As far as the export markets are concerned, uh, the U.S. still continues to carry uh, a higher uh, duty on the Chinese product. So if the Chinese want to get products in, they cannot produce the product 
they can't say they can't sell a Chinese produced product. So if it goes to any of the other channels, there is a bit of an increase in price. But as they go into projects in Europe or into Latin America and some of these other countries, there is no punitive tax tariff or duty on that. So with China having also got stabilized post, you know, all the COVID related issues, etc., there is increased competition coming from uh, from these locations. In any case, the most profitable market that we had outside of uh, India was the US or is the US market. Um, but even there, the, uh, there is competition coming in besides Chinese from, you know, other Chinese indirectly, but from other locations. Because if you see uh, all other geographies, including Southeast Asia, etc., etc., the Middle East, these supply chains have all started, they are all now today in a normal state. They're pretty much equal to what it was in the pre-COVID period. Sure, sure. So there, is a, there is a little bit of an intensity uh, of competition and that's why our sense is that, you know, a long-term guidance that we can maintain is a 25,000, uh, you know, per ton basis. If some product mix changes or if we have anything, any favorable tailwinds, then it could be upwards of it. Sure, sure. And so just largely wanted to understand the realization difference uh, between exports and domestic on the conductor side. Uh, because largely when we produce this particular product domestically and uh, so sell it outside, uh, so what is the realization difference in exports versus domestic? So the, uh, the way I, uh, we had explained in some of the previous calls also is that most of the HTLS and uh, OPGW and these higher end products are sold in the domestic market. Um, and we've moved as much as possible of conventional products into overseas markets where you can end up getting, you know, 10,000, 12,000 rupees a ton higher than uh, in uh, domestic. So when you say 25,000 and looking at the order book uh, and, uh, you know, our crystal ball glazing as we look, you know, into FI24, etc., it takes into account this, this mix. As the conventional product will go to a larger extent towards export and the uh, the premium products will be sold more in the domestic market. Sure, sure. That's it for my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Mohit Kumar from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah. Good evening, sir. And congratulations on a very good set of numbers. Yeah, uh, so my first question is, uh, uh, you mentioned that you're seeing strong demand from the manufacturing capacity. Uh, do you think the segment could be very high in FY24 and 25, or do you think it will remain minuscule in your, in your entire, uh, entire revenue? So I didn't get the question exactly. Are you saying that uh, uh, will the demand remain strong just in FI24 no, no. and 25? No, no, no. So my question is, uh, you said that you are seeing strong demand from new manufacturing capacities, right, which are being set up in this country. Yes. So my question is, does this add materially to the top line in FI24 and FI25, or is it a very small part of the top line? No, so for the cable division, it does, uh, it does have, an, uh, you know, uh, a good incremental benefit. Because if you see... Uh, uh, in terms of the mix that we have, we have 54% uh, of it at the moment getting exported for cables. And then the elastomeric cables is a, is a big section for us, which goes into all these special industries, including renewable, etc., uh, etc. Et but the domestic power cable side of the business has a, a piece which goes into industry for instrumentation cables as well as power cables. So, uh, one of the one of the projects which Apar has been involved in, uh, besides uh, building out its distribution network, um, is to engage with you know the top builders in the country, with the top NEP consultants, and these NEP consultants play uh, quite an important role in terms of the whole uh, cables going into industry. So it is, uh, you know, as time passes on, it will become a, a more and more significant part of the cable business revenues. And at some point of time, do you think that the export of your high premium products can happen in the future? Absolutely. 
Uh, I are we targeting in near term I think if it's a slightly longer term thing so you know the way we've been selling our premium products in india to a very large extent we have been focused on delivering a complete turnkey solution um so uh, and that's the real benefit when you go into a utility and then you pitch to them end to end right from the concept through uh, delivery and the results that come you know out of the execution of the contract now we climbed that uh, you know that level of maturity in overseas markets where we don't do uh, turnkey contracts so we have started engaging with uh, various epc contractors on some of these premium products the demand for the premium products in countries like the united states is lower than in india because there are india has got very severe right of way issues mm-hmm. whereas in some of these other geographies they are just designing a larger line to uh, to be in with you know using conventional products but we've designed a line which can carry the current capacity and more so it's definitely an endeavor but i don't see that in the fy24 uh, you know there, there won't be any meaningful contribution in fy24 there could be a higher input coming from it in 25 26 etc as we continue to engage with overseas uh, customers and so last question sir on the slide number 42 of corporate presentation you have uh, shared the details uh, of the end user segment or uh, so the remainder is 2.7% uh so and you said that remainder is going to be main core driver so is it this not true for the domestic right now is it remainder is a very small portion of now it will grow very significantly over next few years Yeah, so the renewables 2.7 is for the total. If you see exports, it's 48.7 percent. Right, right. And exports will also include some proportion of renewables. So it has, you know, some of the others also segments carry renewables in the sense that you have uh, EPC diversified. So that 0.6 also has EPC players who are buying. This uh, 2.7 percent are largely the developers themselves buying. You know. uh products from us then in the other category also you will find some amount of renewables which are going through a distribution setup you know for rooftop solar and all these sort of products so uh overall you know the renewable side of it is pretty strong on the export side it forms a huge chunk of that uh, 48.7% let's say almost 70% of that is coming from renewables understood sir understood sir thank you sir thank you for the clarification and best of luck sir thank you okay thank you thank you the next question is from the line of amit anwani from prabhudas leelada please go ahead hi sir uh, congratulations for the good set of numbers uh, my first question is on the conductors business uh, uh, we see a uh, pretty phenomenal performance this uh, this year with respect to ebitda per ton but we just wanted to have more color as you already highlighted that is factored in some chinese uh, 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 competition and uh, you know supply chains getting back to normal and uh, we are guiding for 25000 per ton but so just wanted to understand uh, uh, are we you know going to see some uh, moderation in realization anything of that sort or uh, any color if you would like to throw with respect to geographically mix changing and uh, in, in your ppt i can see you, you focused on penetrating into a high growth market so if you could just throw some more color on what kind of strategy you are going to focus on on this side so on, on the conductor specifically on the conductor side your question is in terms of that whether you see uh, 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 a margin compression and uh, and lower pricing is that is that your uh, yes sir so just you yeah, want to understand what what would be the sustainable ebitda pattern because the, the 40000 plus this year also we did not uh, expect it so this far exceeded the expectation so we've already given that guidance that a sustainable base number for us over the next you know uh, foreseeable future is 25000 uh, per ton yes sir. so what we are talking there, there, there are you know the situation is changing on a on a daily basis but in case there are any favorable uh, tailwinds etc even today we have a few 
uh, dispatches that will happen on a fixed price on freight, you know, um, and therefore there may be some freight gain taking place on historical contracts. So we expect that uh, you know it will normalize at around 25,000 uh, per ton on the increased volume that we are talking about. Right. So anything on the uh, uh, penetration on high growth market? Are we talking about no million products or anything? So the high growth markets really for us, the way we are defining high growth markets for uh, overseas markets is essentially those markets where a lot of renewable energy is, is going in. And uh, so that is clearly happening in the United States. I, I had uh, mentioned numbers earlier in the call that uh, what information we've gathered as recently as a couple of weeks ago from some of our uh, top customers and prospective customers in the United States. We are expecting solar installations to increase from 15 gigawatts per year to 30 gigawatts per year in the next two years. Um, and then sustain that for, 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 for several years if they are going to reach the internal targets which have been set you know, within that country. Right. So, uh, so that's clearly one high growth market. Australia is another market where um, we see steady uh, execution over the next few years both on transmission lines as well as uh, on uh, renewable energy uh, generation sources. So um, these markets, I think, as, I, as we mentioned before, it's not going to be a one-year, two-year play. It's, it's, it's going to take longer than that to build out this infrastructure which has been targeted by these countries. And the good thing is that most of these countries are developed countries and they do have, uh, the countries do have the balance sheet to be able to execute these type of projects. They're not depending on third party aid, et cetera, like the African countries. Sure. sure. So my second question is on uh, the premium uh, versus non-premium, if you could share on exports and domestic. And second thing is you mentioned that there is a 10 to 12,000 per ton difference for conventional between domestic and export. So if you could share uh, uh, any uh, difference, you know, uh, if possible for you between uh, 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 premium and non-premium as well. So the premium uh, part of conductors is largely for India and the non-premium, uh, which is which you call as the conventional conductor that goes for the exports market. In terms of the pricing difference, it's difficult to, to give that uh, comparable benchmark because there are it's variety all varieties and it's all order based depending on particular order so we won't be able to quantify the exact difference between uh, the premium so you supplying a conventional conductor in india versus a, versus the same conductor in overseas markets and that's the delta almost uh, 10000 uh, sure because the domestic market actually carries very low margins on conventional products, whereas the buyers overseas, uh, especially the ones that we are targeting, are far more discerning in terms of the quality and uh, approval process. Sure. Sir. My next question is, sir, on the cable side, you guided for 25 to 30% uh, growth for FY24. Uh, is it factoring in uh, much higher growth on electromagnetic? Uh, that is one. Second, what is the contribution of electromagnetic uh, we are expecting uh, uh, in the 24 or maybe one or two years uh, going forward? And what is the contribution of railways uh, in cables which we are expecting? So, uh, uh, the, the entire set of products that go to the Indian railways is part of electromagnetic. Cables and our electromagnetic cables business, we expect it to grow by about 25 to 30 uh, percent. FY24 versus FY23. Sure, sir. So, uh, uh, and la my last question is on B2C contribution. Uh, how much was the B2C contribution through uh, distribution network? So this year we have uh, at about 175 crores. And uh, the comparable number the previous year was a little under 100 crores. Um, and our target is to be able to grow uh, by 150 to 175 crores between this year and next year. Sure, sir. And electromagnetic would be the highest margin business and within cables? 
see, Elastomeric pro- as a product category, yes. But then there are individual products, you know, which are niche products in each category, then they actually uh, also carry good margins. But as a product category, Elastomeric cable, because it, it includes cables that go into defense, it includes cables that go into railways, and it includes the cables that go into uh, the solar uh, wire, uh, solar panel wiring as well as the windmill tower. So it is the most profitable of the categories that we have. Sure, sir. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nimish Shah from MK Investment Managers Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for this opportunity and congratulations on very good set of funding. Uh, so I must start with my Sorry to interrupt, sir, but you are not clearly audible. I request you to please speak closer to the mic. Yeah, am I? Yeah, am I audible? Uh, uh, yes. Slightly better. Yeah, yeah, thanks for this opportunity and congratulations on this set of numbers. Uh, all of my questions are answered. I just have one question now, on, uh, just uh, again on the profitability in the conductor side. So the 25,000 uh, per metric ton uh, uh, guidance that is given on a sustainable basis, I just want to understand uh, what kind of assumption in terms of the export mix uh, do we have for that uh, guidance? Like, you know, does it factor in the current uh, export mix of 60% in the other book? Or slightly lower the price. Or uh, some directional sense it, also. It, it, it factors in about 50 to 55 percent of the revenues coming from export on a sustainable basis. So that's why we said, you know, when you have things like product mix changing, geographic mix changing, you know, you could have, um, you know, some tailwinds coming in and improving that number. But otherwise, on a steady state basis, this is what what we plan. About 50 to 55 percent is what the export portion has been taken at. Right. And the balance 40, 45, uh, will that have, uh, uh, so will that completely be uh, premium products or uh, there will be some portion of the conventional product uh, in the uh, domestic mix? It will be a mix, chair. Yeah. So it will be a mix of premium products as well as the conventional products. In so it has, if you see the balance, uh, it has a, la- a decent quantity of premium product because it contains not only premium conductor products but it also has all the copper based products which is your uh, CTC wires, OPGW, of course uh, OPGW is not copper based but it's fiber optic in there and then we've introduced bus bars as the uh, volume of uh, the railway conductors will taper off. So bus bars, uh, copper bus bars have also been added into the product stream. So we, we don't intend to do a very huge quantity of uh, conventional, you know, just the ACSR conventional uh, conductor. That's not part of that uh, mix. Understood. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Himanshu Upadhyay from O3 PMS. Please go ahead. Hi. We are not able to hear you. Your voice is cracking, Himanshu. Uh, yeah, am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yeah, so my first question was on uh, the competitive intensity, what you stated. Is that increased in domestic market also and uh, the high-end products what uh, uh, we are we have been doing very well in the last few years? So is the competitive intensity higher? So, yeah, other specific reference is not in the domestic market, but it's with respect to the export market. Because if you see the delta which we had in profitability, that some uh, a large portion of it was contributed from uh, the export markets. You know where we had not only an increase in volume, but also an increase in uh, unit margin and realization. So we are referring to the export side. Okay. And the next thing was, what is the situation on these oil prices? Because uh, the last quarter they were falling and uh, inventory write-offs uh, were to be done. Have the prices uh, stabilized and uh, is the demand higher than the supply, which was not the case for the oil last quarter? Are you referring to our oil division? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the raw material... Uh, Can I mention that uh, the pricing scenario there is stabilized?
the pricing has stabilized uh, from February month onwards. And as we get into uh, FY24, the uh, at least the starting point seems reasonably stable. Keeping question. Uh, the industrial volumes in the lubricant space fell by 9% in the quarter. Can you explain the reason what happened? Uh, it was largely due to uh, pricing considerations where you know the, where the margins were a bit tight. So all the commodity type or the lower the the, the lower margin products on industrial we uh, uh, you know allowed that volume to uh, to fall. We kept our focus on the more uh, strategic and long-term customers. But if you see overall, year on year, there's a growth that has happened. Yeah, overall. And have you started winning orders in uh, the renewable side in export markets? And will we have significant revenue in export? No, over 70% of the order book that we have on exports and what we're executing on exports is actually finding its way into the renewable energy segment. No, this is for wiring uh, part, I was asking. Yeah. So we have started getting orders in that business also. For which we have taken that UL approvals and everything. Yeah, yeah. so the UL approvals are uh, catering to... Without UL approval, you can't supply into the renewable energy segment there. So these are uh, wires which are going in for panel wiring, for uh, solar panel wiring, for electrical panel wiring, and for... Uh, taking the output into substations. So any any electrical product in the U.S. requires a UL approval. There are also segments which are uh, uh, wires that are going in into the into the housing segment, but that's not the house wires. They're the power cables, which the low tension cables, which are used for evacuating or bringing power into a house. Not the internal wiring that's going into in the house. Thank you for my time. That's up the first place. Thank you. We have the next question from the line of Poojan Shah from Congruence Advisors. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, my first question would be on the cable division. As we have said, the our order book is around 1200 crores, and which is going to be executed in this quarter uh, specifically. So for that trajectory, it would be around, let's suppose the same order book flows uh, for the year would be around 4,800. And currently our cable division revenue is around 3,300 also. So are we being conservative or are we being seeing some decline or this is the seasonal, are being is a seasonal quarter being a good trajectory? No, no, I, think, I think what, what Ramesh meant is the order book uh, will be executed in a three to four month sort of uh, window uh, over a quarter and uh, our guidance basically is we did around 3300, 3200 uh, odd crores last year and uh, we can see a 25 to 30 percent increase on that uh, uh, you know as, as a guidance that we are able to provide. So fundamentally, the execution will be in that thousand crore per quarter kind of range. Okay, got it. And sir, we have been improved our uh, EBITDA margin by 200 rupees of guidance for uh, cable division. So are we being seeing uh, export uh, book growing up that's why or we are prominent in premium products and that's why we are seeing uh, a big growth on uh, EBITDA margin? So I think it's a combination of both that uh, we continue to see, uh, you know, overall growth in the export volume. We are also seeing uh, uh, a better mix of customers, you know, domestically, including, you know, as the retail and the distribution part of the business grows and that carries better margins than what you would supply to a utility. Um, we are seeing growth on uh, railways and some of these other areas also. So overall is just the product mix, there's also some benefits which will come on conversion costs as the volumes keep growing. There are efficiencies of scale also that come in. So it's not necessary that you will see the EBITDA improving only because margin realization is improving, but there's also economies of scale in manufacturing and things which kick in. Okay. And my last question would be on, uh, as we have uh, uh, disclosed in the presentation for this uh, specific industry, uh, 
like uh, specific industry contributes 8.6 percent so in that how much defense is contributing and how defense defense is evolving for our business uh, coming in i don't think you want to get into all the very sub uh, you know sort of uh, levels but uh, the only point is that uh, the railways will grow at a faster pace than uh, than defense because there's a huge activity happening on the railway side again there is uh, activity happening on the renewable energy side in india but if we see better pricing coming from the overseas markets then we will push the product into the overseas market but one clear area where elastomeric cables will grow is um in the wind segment as well as in the indian railway okay thank you so much thank you thank you the next question is from the line of vibhav bajatia from honesty and integrity investments please go ahead uh, yeah hi so thanks for uh, providing the opportunity so i have a uh, uh, question on the oil division so just what to understand fundamentally uh you know the transform uh, transformer oil and white oil uh, business uh, uh you know transformer oil business is highly concentrated in terms of two three players having big market share but white oil has largely commoditized uh, while the raw material is mostly mostly same came come from the same source so what is the difference that uh, white, white oil lot of small players have been able to uh, commoditize that product but not not the transformer oil what is the reason for so it i think it's our assumption which is not accurate that the raw material that goes into white oil and into transformer oil comes from the same source you may have a refinery that produces grades for both the products but they are different grades and the characteristics that uh, raw material needs to have are vastly different between the two okay okay uh, so so can we can we on yeah. the white oil side there are uh, two sets of products you have one set of products which are technical grade products which have much lower specification and standards the other one is uh, products which are uh, pharmaceutical grade mm-hmm. yeah so uh, the pharmaceutical grade products are also more difficult to manufacture so really the commoditization is in the technical grade uh, white oils or what they call technical grade white oils in terms of you know the pharmacopeia standard okay okay so the technical grade is used mostly in fmcg kind of uh, uh, is that what it is it's not used only in fmcg technical grade is used in a lot of uh, industrial application uh, uh on uh, you know in 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 white oil so it's like knitting oil um and wherever you need non staining you know so master batches you know things like that so those are relatively more commodity Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. So and the some of the hair oil companies in India, they uh, including I don't want to name, but there are some very big names in here also that actually buy a relatively poor quality product. Hmm. 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 Right. Got it. So I think that segment has got largely commoditized. In the case of transformer oil, um, especially on the power transformer side, there are relatively few of players because it's. uh a very uh, you know very high specification in terms of what needs to be uh, delivered hmm hmm got it so two okay. sets of raw materials and two sets of you know uh, specifications on product hmm hmm got it and uh, and and this is uh, you know the question on china particularly in the uh, in and in our oil division itself so china before uh, before covid china was aggressive everywhere you know in every kind of uh, business there is a lot of cost competitiveness that china used to throw in terms of pricing the product and gaining market share but we have not seen that happening on the transformer oil side uh, uh, so why it is the case that uh, that more domestically focused they don't want to export uh, export these uh, these kind of product and create international competition so we don't see chinese competition in the oil business period we don't see chinese competition in transformer oil white oil lubricants outside of meaning either in india or outside india the whole oil industry in china is dominated by petro china by the state oil companies 
and uh, they see little benefit in carrying all these speciality grades you know outside of their country hmm 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 right so the chinese uh, competition is more in terms of conductors outside of north america as well as in some of the cable categories hmm hmm got it uh and lastly uh, you know this uh, impact of uh, you know elect- electric vehicles that is uh, that is going to be there both on the demand side for our product and the raw material side for our product because evs uh, evs will sure 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 adversely impact uh, auto lubricant business uh, but on the on the other end transmission uh, you know trans- uh, distribution trans- transformer oil business can uh, can offset that but on the raw material side uh, you know it's refined uh, refineries are not going to be uh, throwing as much output that then over long term how the base oil prices are going to be have any um, uh, any view that you might offer and how we are going to cope up so you know uh, i don't have any any view to offer as such because the um, the adoption of uh, electric vehicles um you know the trajectory of that is still not clear so in india you are seeing traction happening uh, largely in uh, two wheelers mm. and the total volume of two wheelers in lubricants is not necessarily very large because it's only 900 ml or 1 liter goes into a particular motorcycle or a scooter scooter is even less um so there is the main lubricant demand comes from uh, trucks that's yeah. the largest segment followed by agriculture which is your tractors harvesters all those things and then next comes passenger car and then the last is uh, motorcycles mm-hmm. so right now adoption of motorcycles has been increasing but overall lubricant sales you know is is almost flat but hasn't fallen mm. got it got it yeah Uh, and lastly you know uh, i think uh, in 2021 we launched this new natural ester based transformer oil any development on that how much it has become as a percentage it's still, of it's still in a development stage uh, in the sense that many utilities there are about six utilities in india that have uh, installed transformers with the with the ester oil in it um, so our sense is it will take a few years for getting the feedback and also and all these you know as the esg pressure starts uh, coming on these uh, entities the, the adoption will then increase once they got confidence that the product works yeah mm-hmm. well i think there is a bunch of others who want to uh, get into the queue yeah. so maybe that uh, that's it that's from my side allow yeah. someone else to yeah thank sure. you thank you the next question is from the line of sujal chandare from girik capital please go ahead yeah hello am i audible Yes. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Congratulations on this set of numbers. I had a few questions around cable segment. So in cable segment, I was facing similar increasing competitive intensity in export markets, as in case of conductor segment. So uh, there is some amount of uh, you know, as I said, basically as the supply chains are getting normalized, um, you know, customers are coming back during the COVID period. People were ready to pay any price that was quoted. because supplies were difficult supply chains were broken etc so as they normalize it's natural that uh, uh, you know negotiations will uh, start happening uh, with a higher intensity than was during the covid period having said that uh, the chinese are uh, chinese companies are active uh, on the cable side including trying to export to the us but and that export is happening through indirect means as i explained earlier that they have either taken over a company in some other geography but that doesn't allow them to have exactly the same competitive intensity as they would have if they were exporting from china directly okay okay got it to gain some share they are quoting prices which are aggressive uh, etc etc but we uh, but you know the cable market is very large and it allows uh, opportunity to go to uh, you know different uh, clients and different uh, meaning uh, different geographies also okay this so is the volume so basically the volume growth in the export market won't be a uh, problem but the margin could be impacted in that sense right yeah the margins could be mar- a little bit lower than in the previous period just simply because 
simply because of uh, you know the supply chain getting straight, uh, getting smoothened out um but we are going into newer and newer markets and we are uh, also from existing customers we are hoping to get larger amount of business because last year was the first year where the cable business really did a massive amount of export we, we hit 1400 plus crores of export uh last year which was the first year where it was such a big chunk of the of the revenues also keep in mind that margins as i mentioned earlier is also a part of your conversion cost to the efficiency of of scale that you have so as the business keeps scaling up um the conversion cost will also improve okay okay just last just on the last question on this quarter margins uh, we 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 made about 12.4 percent margins so it uh, i guess largely was because of the improved products which and as you said the conversion cost so the premium premium portion which you are saying the unsustainable sector would it uh, count as uh, meaningful in the margin terms okay so in the fourth quarter we had quite a lot of shipments that were taken by you know uh, by customers where we supply a lot of specialized cables like the defense bot there were quite a few shipments that went into defense there was more shipments that went into the indian railways etc so that's how you know we had a higher percentage but i would really look at the full year uh, because that would you know you can have a quarter which can give a misleading number when you look at a, a rolling four month uh, or sorry a four quarter period it will give a better uh, a better idea or an estimate but overall we see uh, an improved ebitda on a 25 to 30% increased volume in the cable business Okay, okay. Thank you. That's from my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Gopal from HDFC Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, sir, and uh, thanks to the entire team for great sets of results. I just uh, want to understand, you know, the better profitability on the conductor business. Is the current uh, domestic profitability? tending towards the long term uh, you know, profitability which we have guided for and uh, or or we are at upper end or the lower end of it and how the export profitability is likely to behave in the times to come thanks so you know um, the domestic profitability is not something that we will see some major changes on it's really Uh, the domestic profitability uh, can move up and down based on the mix of product you know in case hpls uh, reduces then it will have an impact but otherwise it's already in a reasonably uh, steady state where where you can see a certain fall in profitability is uh, from some of the favorable things which we had on export sure you know the freight logistics etc we are all export phenomena it is not not really a anything on the domestic side okay uh, I, i can sense that but what uh, we are seeing like uh, with the rising volume and you know like uh, tremendous demand in export uh, countries so just wanted to sense uh, you know some the directionally <clears throat> how do you foresee actually because uh, like uh, you know guiding from uh, 58 or 45000 in the yearly basis to 25 you know so it's a very long term so just we wanted to know the trajectory how do you foresee it so i mean it's not going to fall off like a step from uh, you know straight down to 25 but in a in a in a few quarters it will it will come down towards you know uh, that level which we think is a is a good steady state base base level Sure, sir. And uh, in any you know strategy on the consumer cable business, how, how you know how is it progressing? Any qualitative uh, uh, you know statement? So there is a slide in the pack which actually gives all the metrics um, you know on that. And as we said earlier, you know we we have been working towards a game plan of increasing uh, distributors, you know electricians who are onboarded with the company, etc. And that's going on as per the plan. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pawan Nahar, an individual investor. Please go ahead. 
Thank you so much, Kushal Bhai, Apar Bhai, uh, Kushal Bhai, Chaitanya Bhai, and Team Apar. Congratulations. Thank you. So, a few, few, few questions. So one is we've done about 107 rupees EPS in H2. And as you said, the conductor profits would not fall off immediately, but in a few quarters, it will get to that long term trajectory. So, can we expect that for the first half, this run rate will be maintained broadly? So the actually what will happen, uh, Pawan, is that uh, the PNL will be depending on the amounts of projects that we are executing. Uh, so you know all these are made to order business, and we normally look at give the guidance and uh, based on a 12 month number because the quarter or half year may not represent the current picture. So you know based on the guidance on the 12 month picture is how we need to work out and. At the since it's the beginning of the year, it's too early to predict the how things would pan out uh, during the you know half year one or half year. So, a, a Pawan's question is on the first half. Whether the first half, whether you can take fourth quarter and extrapolate it, I don't think that that's going to be the. It's one quarter. You know, the fourth quarter was a very very strong quarter, which is uh, largely not. <laughs> But uh, the first half of uh, this year, uh, you know, should be comparable uh, or, or maybe even slightly better than the first half of last year. Because if you saw the third and fourth quarter of last year really pulled away in terms of, you know, the profitability and margin. So, um, but it will, it, you know, we expect it to uh, come off, the conductor margins to come off over a couple of quarters. You know, there will be a fall in Q1 and then again uh, fall further fall in q2 because a new business which is getting signed on is not carrying those sort of outsized uh, margin yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. no issues i mean basically what we are saying is fy24 will be a year of normalization for the long term trend right i mean it may still be a little better in, in cricket parlance you know we scored a triple century in the fourth quarter so uh, you know <laughs> it may not Score a triple century in FY24, but if you see the long-term trends of the products and all, they are all uh, all going in the right direction. So, so basically, it normalizes in FY24, and after that, next three to five years of strong growth for the firm as a whole. You see steady, you see steady growth happening, and you know I gave an example of uh, what uh, the US is expecting from you know the major customers that we are in touch with. They are expecting to go from 15 gigawatts to 30 gigawatts. So even if some amount of competitive intensity increases and things, the market itself is going to grow double in size. And we are, um, you know, and as time passes by, I think we'll be better entrenched with some of these clients. Based on your guidance, I was just doing some back of the envelope maps and what it appears to me in FY24, cables will be approximately 40% plus of our net profit, right? I mean, we may not, uh, but that was just doing the match, so that was interesting. The third thing I wanted to ask you was, what is the volume growth we are speaking for conductors this year? Only 15 or it could be higher? 10 to 15. No, 10 to 15%. 10 to 15%, okay. And... Um, so if the volume of HTLS goes up, then you know the total volume in terms of tonnage will go down, the value will go up. So about 10 to 15 percent in terms of uh, number of metric tons process. Got it. Got it. And all the best. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was our last question for today. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Kushal Desai for closing comments. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. I'd uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, participating in our uh, Q4 and FY23 earnings call. Uh, thank you for your patience and your uh, involvement and appreciation of the company's results. Um, I'd just like to conclude by saying that um, we still see, uh, you know, all the uh, long-term uh, growth metrics are in place. Uh, profitability in the fourth quarter was a bit outsized. Um, there may there will be some amount of normalization as we go into FY24 and 25, but all the growth in, indices uh, seem to be in, intact. 
and uh, we are looking forward to the next uh, few years of uh, continuing our trajectory of growth. So thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of Apar Industries Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines.